So why are investors so bad? This was a Dabbler study. It hasn't been done for a while, but it's, it's basically the same. If we, do you remember what we said? If we just bought the S&P 500 and gone on a cruise, gone to sleep, knocked yourself out, gone and joined a monastery and left it, you'd make an average of about 11% a year. The average stock investor, because I know sometimes I beat up the average investor and I say, oh, they lose money. Actually, some of them accounts actually do make money, but they just don't make as much as the index. Do you get what I mean? So if the S, okay, and I've had this before where people have come back to me and say, oh, my manager made 60%. Congratulations, you made 60%, but the s and is up 90%. So your manager has underperformed the index and he's charged your fees for it as well, and you're happy. So you've got nothing in return. You, you got a minus. You know, you would have been better off. It's like in a blind study. If we're doing a pharmaceutical study and I give you all sugar and you feel great and I, and I give these other guys this, um, this drug and it, it, they feel exactly the same, how can I say that my drug actually is working because the placebo does the same? So if we take the benchmark, and we're not beating the benchmark, then we're not worthy. You shouldn't be paying a fund manager to get you below the benchmark when you could just do it yourself in an S&P 500. Anyway, so the big difference is, is um, people trading, and people trading badly. That's probably the best word to put it. And I think, you know, a bit what Richard was saying as well, how smart people do dumb things. And I see it all the time. And Many people that come to me are very, very intelligent. You know, I've got no way should I even criticise because academically, I am very, very dumb. And these people, they're doctors, they're dentists, they're heart surgeons, they are really, really smart people. But when you put them in front of an IG index screen, they just become stupid. They're just like, ah, bells, whistles, I want to trade, I want to buy, I want to sell. And they listen to CNBC and all these things and they just lose any sense of the discipline that they use in their daytime business. Um, so that's basically what they do. So I like losing traders, and you're going to laugh because we've got a little video clip coming up shortly. But we learn a lot, and I think what Chris was saying earlier today, we learn a lot from losing traders. So if anybody comes to me that's losing money, I my ears are pricking up because I want to know what they do because we can do the opposite. So what losing traders do is overtrade, that's the first thing, too big a position for the account, taking profits too soon, again just reiterating what Chris was saying as well, taking losses too soon. Now I know this isn't normally in the books, most people will say, oh, you know, but what I've also seen is people can become the opposite in that it, what I call death by a thousand cuts. So they don't, eat, they, they open a trade but they almost close it straight away even though the system hasn't said, as soon as it makes a small loss. Now, I understand not letting a trade run into a big losing position. That I understand. However, you've also got to let, give a trade a bit of breathing time as well. You've seen many of my trades initially don't make money. And also, if you're spread betting, you've got to cover the spread. So if you're going to get out, literally, almost as soon as you're opening the trade, you're just going to get death by a 1,000 cuts. Sunk cost. This is a case, and again, I think Chris referred to it this morning, where people have lost 400 pounds. I can't get out now, I've lost 400. I've lost 800. Well, I can't get out now, I've lost 800. It's the same with businesses. If you watch any of the Ramsey programs when people open restaurants in the nightmares, and he says, how much have you put in? I put 250 grand into this restaurant. I've remortgaged my house. My wife's left me, all the rest of it. But I can't close it down. They've just, you know, when the really, they had no right to be in the restaurant business, but they've just put everything in there and they're on a Hail Mary. So that's the sunk cost effect. Trading to escape. You know, there's a lot of people that trade because they don't like their job. They think their job's boring, but they're not actually trading to make a living. They're just doing it for a bit of fun. They're doing it because it's the in thing to do. Victim mentality, we talked about this morning, so I won't go over it too much, but it's like, oh yeah, it's all right for you. you you're a multimillionaire. I can't trade. I can't do this. You know, oh, you know, nothing ever works out for me. Again, back to the luck factor. Um, so we have that. Never happy, should have, would have, could have. Well, I only made £1,000. If I put more money on, I could have made £2,000. If they lose money, they've lost money. So they're never happy, and that's a really bad state to be in. Um, poor discipline, no real plan, and then self-destruct. The average account lasts around six months. That's why they constantly have to advertise and keep bringing in new clients.
it's a great word that you know Jerry Seinfeld said. If everything you've done in your life has obviously been wrong, then surely the opposite was the correct thing to do. And I know we laugh and joke, but if somebody comes to me and says, "Oh, your trading system doesn't work. It's rubbish," and all the rest of it, do the opposite. See how that works out for you. Yeah. Or if somebody, you know, if somebody comes to me and says, "Oh, it keeps losing," and all the rest of it, do the opposite. Our business is completely transparent. For every buyer, you can have a seller. All right. So if I've got a long signal, and you think the system doesn't work, or run, then do the opposite. Sell on it. Do exactly because that's what we're doing, aren't we? When we see that the majority of IG index clients are long, taking the opposite end. We're doing the opposite. And you know, going back to what we're saying with Richard Wiseman and why I'm so interested in behaviour and psychology more than anything else, because the market's made up of people. And Ben Graham years ago, and if you don't know about Graham and Dodd, that's who Warren Buffett is a student of, which is why he wrote the foreword. The investor chief problem and even the worst enemy is likely to be himself. And that is so, so true. So what do I believe? What do I know after doing this? I 32 years coming up in September, 18 odd years of winning, is day-to-day -day markets may be random. All right. So on a day-to-day, -day, if you ask me what the Dow's going to do today, I don't really know. Um, you know, and Chris is doing some shorter-term systems uh, with exits and entries. That's great. I like the way actually that you made a lot of your money over a weekend because there's this thing in some traders say, "Oh, we don't hold positions over the weekend." Yet it's many times holding positions over a weekend is where you actually can make big, big money. Um, but you know, say 20 years back-to-back -back profits. It, ca it can't just be luck, there has to be something. So I've spent years developing my systems and the big influences to me are, well a couple of people, one is in this room, I was going to say everybody's dead but they're not. Um, <laughs> Richard Donchian, he is dead. So he was the guy from Price Channels and which influenced the turtle traders. I don't use them as much now but that was where I started getting into trend trading and price action rather than any news. David Harding, a name that some of you might not know, um, is Winton Capital. So there was a program called AHL and I actually invested, uh, he'd actually left it before I'd invested, but there was a company called Man Group that owns the AHL program. And he was very mathematical based. He's still around and Winton Capital is still around. You can actually Google Winton. Stock Traders Almanac, which is Jeff and Jeff's father, um, I first got my first copy of the Almanac in 1999, back in the old post days, and I remember getting this through and it was like, oh wow. So I started to put some of that into there.